So introducing our topic for today, co-hosted by High Immigrant Cities of Migration and Bertels Manskifteng, the Refugee Jobs Agenda Entrepreneurship Offers Pathway to Employment. Refugees have left everything behind, including successful businesses. Now in their communities, many of these refugees are actually fueled by entrepreneurial spirit and eager to reestablish their businesses or create new ones in their new cities. Many progressive communities have already established programs and services to support immigrant entrepreneurs, recognizing the challenges and barriers faced by the, the immigrant population in starting and growing a business. And while refugees have a new pathway to their new country, many of these programs and services can support refugee and immigrant entrepreneurship to really flourish in the new host communities. So today we're here to discuss lessons learned from two successful initiatives that have supported immigrant entrepreneurs to overcome barriers uh, to a successful path to entrepreneurship. So without further ado, I'm very delighted to welcome our speakers today. The first is Isaac Rolden, who is the Director of Small Business Services at Canva based in New York. Uh, he is responsible for the day-to-day -day management and oversight of all the SBF programs, including Mobilize Your Business, a program designed to teach immigrant small business owners and worker-owner cooperatives how to leverage technology to increase revenues, decrease expenses, and operate their business with a high level of efficiency. Isaac leads an entrepreneurial assistance team providing small business education, tailored training, and small business loans to immigrant entrepreneurs, helping them to establish, grow, and expand their businesses. Prior to Canva, Isaac held a series of progressively more responsible positions for ASEAN, one of the premier microfinance organizations in the world. He's also managed several teams, including business development, small business lending, and portfolio management. He has a wealth of experience, um, and I've been fortunate enough to interview him, so I'm very keen to learn about his passion for finding a solution to the immigrant entrepreneurial challenge. Uh, the second speaker is Lena Saad, who is the Senior Manager and Development and Community Engagement at Scadding Court Community Centre in uh, Toronto. Um, Lena, I... <clears throat> uh, Lena... Lena works at the community level on innovations in economic resiliency. Her current portfolio includes business out-of-the-box initiative. And prior to SCC, Lena worked on a neighborhood-based planning initiative with Hamilton's Neighborhood Action Strategy on public housing, economic development, and revitalization with the New York City Housing Authority and the Rosenberg Housing Group. She holds a master's degree in urban planning from the City University of New York Hunter College and is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. We're very excited to have both speakers uh, with us today. And we'll start uh, with a presentation from Isaac Rolden. So I'll hand it over to you, Isaac. Thank you, Kajal. I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, so I'll be speaking uh, a little bit about CAMBA as an organization. Uh, then I will dive into the economic development arm of CAMBA and specifically small business services and uh, our services offered to immigrant uh, immigrants and immigrant entrepreneurs. Uh, so just a little bit about CAMBA. CAMBA has been in operation for 40 years. Uh, started primarily as a refugee servicing agency uh, in response to the emerging needs of the Vietnamese, Laotian, and Cambodian refugees uh, then living in Brooklyn. We've successfully resettled over 10,000 refugees and have connected 25,000 refugees and political asylees to stable full-time jobs. Uh, we currently connect 1,200 low-income and immigrant refugee New Yorkers to jobs on an annual basis. We also have a adult literacy program, uh, which offers 84 classes to 1,500 adult learners every year. And our legal team, our attorneys, uh, assist almost 1,600 families and individuals with uh, legal immigration issues on an annual basis. Next slide, please. 
so economic development. Economic development at Canva uh, has two arms. One is workforce development, and the other uh, is small business services. So for our workforce development group, uh, they've connected over 1,200 low-income immigrants and refugee New Yorkers to jobs with an average wage of $13 an hour. Uh, we've also uh, connected uh, refugees and political asylees to 350 jobs within four months of their arrival at the U.S., and they average a wage of 11.75 an hour. Uh, we also offer secu security guard training. Uh, we have a security guard training academy in-house uh, where we certify security guards for licensing by New York State and provide job placement assistance for those that graduate the program. <clears throat> and they, they also average higher wages. So diving into Canva Small Business Services. Uh, so Canva Small Business Services, in 2016, we served over 500 immigrant and low-income aspiring and existing entrepreneurs. Uh, we successfully assisted in the startup of 27 new businesses in New York City. Uh, in 2016, 12 existing businesses that we provided technical assistance uh, increased their revenues for a total of 876000 uh, in aggregate sales. And we've helped our clients, uh, small business clients, create or retain 36 jobs. We also assisted in the development of seven financial packages for a total of 72,000 in small business loans, and 14 aspiring entrepreneurs completed their comprehensive business plan, which comes with two years of financial projections. Oh, next slide, please. So understanding your audience, uh, I think one of, the, uh, one of the points that we try to stress uh, so much at Canvas Small Business Services is really understanding your clients, especially immigrant clients, when they walk through your doors. It's really important to sort of uh, have an initial needs assessment interview with your client so that you can understand whether they were an entrepreneur in their native country or not, and what type of entrepreneurship practices they had in their native country. So as you can see in the slide, uh, to the left, you have an entrepreneur uh, from Jamaica selling goods in Jamaica. This individual uh, migrates to the United States, and although they have an entrepreneurship spirit, it's difficult for them to automatically become entrepreneurs in the United States. But in order for us to help uh, this individual for J from Jamaica, it is very, very important that we understand their entrepreneurship style when they were, uh, when they were uh, servicing their clients in Jamaica. That will allow for sort of the uh, development of the skills necessary to become that entrepreneur in the United States. And similarly, you have uh, a case of an entrepreneur in Mexico as well, right? So really understanding their day-to-day, -day, how they purchased their products, how they sold their products, where they sold their products, uh, did, was it necessary to have licenses, permits, so on and so forth, so you can understand the way they operated day to day and what, what's the necessary training and technical assistance necessary so that they can operate day to day in the country they've migrated to. <clears throat> so some of the challenges uh, that are common denominators amongst almost all our immigrant entrepreneurs uh, that walk through our doors or the immigrants that are looking to become entrepreneurs uh, are listed here. So you have education as one of the barriers. Uh, and when I, when I mention education, I don't necessarily, uh, I'm not necessarily referring to formal education. Uh, you have a level of education in business that's necessary uh, to sort of operate, and so at times that's missing. Uh, we find that to be true because um, many entrepreneurs, many immigrant entrepreneurs are not entrepreneurs by choice. They're sort of entrepreneurs because it's the only way uh, they can make money in their native country. So it's really important uh, to understand whether they have that basic business education, um, whether tracking their income and expenses, for example, so that they can understand exactly how the, the financial health of their business. 
Um, language, of course, is a barrier as well, which is why our adult language literacy classes are so important uh, to many of our clients. Uh, language, of course, comes with literacy. Um, so teaching them to read and, and understand the language uh, and the rules of the language are really important for them to communicate with their clients um, if they're looking to expand outside of the immediate community uh, that they move into. Uh, understanding the laws of the country that they migrate to. So again, thinking about the licenses and permits, uh, taxes, and, and reporting their income, and so on and so forth, is really important for uh, entrepreneurs to understand, and it's a key factor in the growth of the business moving forward. Uh, business formation is a challenge for us as well. We, we understand that there are many uh, informal entrepreneurs operating uh, in the United States, uh, not forming a legal business entity, uh, so not recognized as a business. Uh, and, and it's important for them to be able to do that, uh, again, in order for them to grow in the future. Um, licenses, permits needed to operate, uh, it's really important to provide training uh, and information to entrepreneurs on the licenses that they need uh, in order to operate legally. Um, and not run into problems uh, as, as they continue to sell their products or services. Uh, informality. So informality is a, a really important point. Uh, we have uh, so many entrepreneurs, uh, especially immigrant entrepreneurs, that operate informally, right? So uh, they're not tracking their income. Uh, they're not tracking their expenses. They're not able, they, don't, they do not have the ability to prove exactly how much money their business is making. Therefore, they're unable to apply for financing. So when you're looking for a small business loan with a bank or a, uh, a financing organization, it's really important that you have all, all of your financial documents, which include profit and loss statements and balance sheets and, at the very least, uh, bank account statements showing deposits. Um, and many entrepreneurs, especially immigrant entrepreneurs, for a myriad of reasons, uh, don't report their income. Um, so it's really important to get them to see sort of uh, the, the benefits of being able to report their income, access financing, and grow their businesses in the future. Um, and, and of course, again, there's government, right? The legalities of operating a business uh, in the country that they migrate to. So having that information readily available to them at the beginning will remove a lot of the barriers uh, that, that exist for entrepreneurs um, and will allow them to move forward in growing their business. Next slide, please. So aligning your services. Uh, I think that uh, this, these are one of the areas where Canva Small Business Services has sort of learned uh, many, many a lessons uh, from, from our client base. It's super important to always communicate with existing and previous clients to understand new challenges that arise and uh, specifically aligning your services to meet those challenges. Um, it, it's really important. So identifying all the steps necessary to start, grow, and expand your business, it's one of the first steps that we take when an immigrant entrepreneur or an aspiring immigrant entrepreneur um, you know, walks into our doors. Uh, we created a process to identify talent. So you have immigrants that were entrepreneurs in their native country. You want to be able to identify that. You'd like to be able to identify their challenges uh, and, the, and their talents right? so that you can sort of mold them um, the way they need to be molded so that they can successfully operate uh, in their new environment. Um, and their passion for business. Uh, I, can't, I can't stress enough uh, the amount of entrepreneurs that walk into through outdoors and just have a passion uh, for entrepreneurship, have you know, almost no interest in the workforce, uh, especially if they, they've been uh, operating for several years. It's really difficult to sort of transition over. So they just really need that assistance and that guidance uh, to become successful. Uh, and key partnerships. So <laughs> another thing that we've learned as, as one of our lessons is that we cannot be everything to everyone. Uh, and I think that's really important to understand. So developing key partnerships where uh, you have partners 
that provide really quality, uh, quality services that you don't provide and putting that together as sort of an ecosystem um, so that entrepreneurs can be successful um, and taking steps to that success. Uh, but partnerships are key. Um, you, know, you, you identify where your needs are as a service provider and you look for those partnerships to fill those gaps, providing you know, a comprehensive service to your clients so they're not bouncing from one organization to the other without some guidance, which can be very, very discouraging. Um, if we, we found in our experience that many will stop seeking assistance because of the you know, sort of uh, jump from organization to organization and the confusion on the services provided by each organization. And constantly developing staff, understanding that, uh, especially you know, with technology nowadays, uh, needs will change, uh, entrepreneurs' uh, challenges will evolve, and keeping up to date with that and, and having your staff keep up to date with that. So when you're teaching uh, your workshops and you're teaching, um, you're training entrepreneurs one-on-one, -on -one, um, everyone on your team is, is up to date with, with the new challenges of, of immigrant entrepreneurs. Next slide. Uh, so transforming entrepreneurial talent. Uh, so this slide, uh, if you look to the left, uh, you will see a what is considered a beauty salon in the Dominican Republic, right? So you have this outside setup uh, where you have two young women uh, braiding the hair of a client. Uh, and when you're, when you're immigrant entrepreneurs or you're aspiring in, immigrant entrepreneurs walk through your doors, what you want to be able to do is identify that talent so that you can successfully transform it into the picture that you see below it. So the picture that you see below is a beauty salon in Brooklyn. Right? So how can I help this immigrant entrepreneur who can obviously operate a salon to see her, themselves operating this salon in their new environment, right? And what are the steps necessary to get them there? Because the talent and the skill already exist, they really just need some assistance in how to go ahead and operate a successful business in their new environment. And the same thing with the pictures on the right. You have an immigrant entrepreneur that's obviously selling food um, in her native country, uh, and below that, you have an entrepreneur in our environment selling food in a very similar way, right? And if, when these entrepreneurs walk through your doors, if you can see sort of that vision for them, um, then you can uh, break down the steps necessary to transform them into entrepreneurs in their new environment. Uh, so. Success story of Cesar Rosa. Cesar Rosa uh, is an immigrant entrepreneur from the Dominican Republic. Uh, sells, uh, I'd say, about uh, 100 to 125 different items uh, as a street vendor. And he's always had the passion of uh, owning his own brick and mortar, his own storefront. Uh, but because of his informality and, and uh, inability to understand uh, the licenses and so on that he needed to operate, and also understand that in order for him to access financing, he would need to track his income and expenses. Uh, that was a challenge for him. We were able to uh, provide him assistance in uh, formalizing his business, uh, creating a legal entity uh, for his business. As you can see, he's currently working on a iPad where he has the square point of sale system, and uh, he's now able to track his income and expenses and show that to financing organizations so that they could go ahead and provide him the financing necessary for him to transition from a street vendor into a storefront, which he has successfully been able to do. And Cesar is now uh, scheduled to move into his own place within the next three months. Uh, because he transitioned from operating as an informal entrepreneur to a formal entrepreneur. Uh, so strengthening your services, really, really important. Um, training and development should continue um, over time to ensure the success of your clients, and that's training and development from the top to the bottom of your organization, really, so that every immigrant entrepreneur, aspiring 
immigrant entrepreneur hears the same exact message consistently throughout the organization. Client ambassadors, so a success story uh, like similar to the one I just shared, uh, he would probably be chosen as a client ambassador uh, within the community because within immigrant communities, trust is so important. If you're an outsider and you're coming in to provide services, uh, usually there's this reluctancy to, um, to speak. Uh, so having these ambassadors in the community is super helpful in introducing us to potential clients in the future. Um, consistently survey prior clients. I can't stress this enough. We've learned so much from our client base um, that it, it is really important to interview at least once a year so that uh, you make sure that you're relaying the right message, that your marketing materials are understood by your client base, um, and you're they're getting the message that you're looking to communicate to them. Uh, updating your curriculum. Uh, we've, I think we add a course to our workshops every year. Um, so as you provide one-on-one -on -one training to your clients, it's really important to identify the common denominators uh, of their challenges so that you can develop workshops uh, and services revolving around those common denominators. Um, and partnerships. Partnerships are really important. Uh, so uh, you know, develop as many partnerships that uh, provide services to your clients as much as possible. Uh, so uh, that wraps up my presentation. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us this morning. And I'll pass it over to, I believe, Kajal. Thank you so much, Isaac. And I, I've certainly seen firsthand some of the incredible work you're doing. So um, in the audience, please do note down your questions for Isaac at the end, and, and we'll try to get through some of those. So our next speaker is Lena Saad. And just a quick reminder, she is the Senior Manager of Development and Community Engagement for Scadding Court Community Center. Her current portfolio includes the Business Out of a Box initiative, which leverages informal infrastructure and underutilized spaces and facilitates newcomer-friendly application process uh, to make entrepreneurship accessible for the immigrants and refugees arriving. So we're very excited to have you with us today and hear more about the initiative, Lena. So you have the podium now. Thank you. Um, can, can you guys hear me? Um, so my name is Lena Saad, and I'm very happy to be here with you guys. Um, I will be talking about Business Out of the Box, um, which is an initiative um, located in Toronto. So uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, so Business Out of the Box is a story about how we can leverage underutilized resources and spaces to create jobs and change inside of our neighborhood. Um, this initiative is run by Skating Court Community Center, which is a full-service community center in downtown Toronto. So we offer recreation services, people can come play sports, um, access daycare, and we also have settlement services for immigrants and refugees. Hi, Lena. Sorry to interrupt. It's Devin here. We're just having trouble hearing you. There's a lot of um, echo and background noise. I'm not Thanks. sure if you're speaking into, um, if you've got the phone right to your right to your face. Is this, this is better? That's much more louder, yeah. OK, sorry about that. Um, OK, so just a very, very quick recap. So Business Out of the Box uses um, underutilized resources to create um, jobs and create change inside of neighborhoods. It's run by Skating Court Community Center, which is where I work. Um, Skating Court is a full-service community center in downtown Toronto that offers settlement services for immigrants as well as recreation services um, and daycare and so on for families. Um, so next slide. Uh, so Scouting Court um, is that yellow star that you see on your screen. It's located in downtown Toronto. Um, Toronto is Canada's largest city with a population of around 3 million people. Next. Um, great. And so you can see Scouting Court in the center over there. And this is our neighborhood. So bordering it to the north is a really popular neighborhood in, in downtown Toronto that's known for vintage shops, food, and public art. Um, to the 
So also surrounding our neighborhood, we have a Chinatown. Um, bordering our specific community center, we have um, government-sponsored housing. So um, a lot of times people who live there are probably low income and are receiving housing supports. And then to the west of us, we have a more affluent neighborhood. Um, and about 60% of our residents in our direct neighborhood um, are, are immigrants. So this is scouting court before we implemented um, the business out of the box box concept called Market 707. So you could see our, our streetscape is drab, it's monotonous, um, and it runs through one of Toronto's major street arteries, and it wasn't doing such a great service to the neighborhood. So this is um, Scouting Court after we implemented our business out of the box Market 707. Um, you can see we use the concept of Bob to um, to transform our space surrounding the community center and create a real community and economic asset. And so by doing this, we found various benefits, which I'll go into. So one thing that we did is um, we activated a local economy. So we currently have 22 businesses at Market 707, and it ranges in different types of, of businesses. On the left, you see um, a young man named Chase, he started a drop-in bike repair shop. Um, on the right, you see Naya. Naya started a dreadlock cleaning service that has a customer base that um, spans cities surrounding Toronto, such as Detroit. Um, we also have people who, there's a tattoo repair shop, cell phone repair shop, and then a bunch of food stalls. Um, so. The other thing we did was we made entrepreneurship accessible to people with low resources, especially newcomers and immigrants. So the top left-hand corner, you see Cookie Martinez. She started with a tiny um, tent stall at Market selling her cookies. She expanded then into Market 707 to sell her cookies only as a retailer, um, and now she has a full menu um, restaurant operating at Scatting Court. On the on the right, you see Shinji. He started Gushi Chicken. He, when he started this stall, he was 21 years old. Um, he barely spoke any English, and now he's expanded to two locations. One is in a hot spot in Toronto, and um, he employs up to 10 people. Um, on the bottom left, you see Diona. She got her start. She's from the Philippines. She got her start here in Toronto at a McDonald's, um, and now. Not only does she run an amazing catering cafe, but she also, um, sorry, she runs her stall at Market 707, and she also runs a full catering company and employs five people. Um, and then on the bottom right, you see Amir. He has been in this country for less than, less than a year. Um, he's from Aleppo in Syria, and he just started a, a stall with us um, a couple of months ago and is able to... Um, uh, it's him and his wife who are who are running his business. Um, so next slide. And the other thing that we did was we turned this this space into a real um, into a real community asset. And the street the street landscape has now become an asset not only for our neighborhood but for the city as a whole. So next slide. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So the way that we do this is, one, we use this informal, informal infrastructure, which is um, pretty inexpensive, to create an opportunity of affordable rent. So rent is about is 11 to $25 a day. So that's between $350 and $800 um, a month. Um, and oh, sorry, go back. So what they get for, for this rent is we provide for them a contained water system. So that's a sink, a pump, and a water heater. We provide electricity for them, and we also provide them with access to water. So they have to invest initially in um, the amenities and the fin finishings, the appliances that they need to run their own business. Um, so that's like about $2,000 to start. So next. Um, so two, we, make, we create a process that encourages um, barrier-facing entrepreneurs to actually access this, this retail space. 
So for example, we don't require that they have a business plan written out. We don't require a, a credit check before they rent the space and they're not required to speak English before they rent the space. What the application process does entail um, is we require them to explain their business idea. We ask about their experience before committing, uh, sorry, before choosing to open up a business in Canada. And then we also make sure that they understand all their permits and permissions that are necessary. So it's required, for example, that they have a business license if they're selling food, a food, food handling license, and so on. Um, and we also, if, if they respond no to any of those questions, then we will support them in getting that. Um, but yes, it would be great if we had a connection to someone like Canva um, you know, to support that kind of service. Um, so the next thing that we, the way we do this is we do it by partnering with local, with local based operations, so local nonprofits. So the picture you see here is of the Thorncliffe Park Women's Committee. They're a, they're a small grassroots nonprofit group that's made up of, um, of newcomer women in Toronto. And they're looking to use a shipping container to create um, a community cafe that would operate two different businesses out of it and also will be used as a training ground for, um, for newcomer women to acclimate to Toronto, to learn the language, and to gain business skills as well. Um, and you know, some of the challenges in implementing a business out of the box in other areas with local partnerships is that it takes a different, it takes long, um, there's, there are unique process, there are unique situations in different neighborhoods that you would have to um, kind of think about, like different permitting processes um, and a different cultural reality. Um, so this is almost in the ground and it's taken about two years to get there. Um, and the other thing is we've relied on a lot of various partners to make this happen. So um, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, Metcalf Foundation, Ryerson Diversity Institute have all helped us with creating the model and studying the impact. The City of Toronto has helped us navigate the permissions process and then our private partners has, have helped us get the infrastructure um, and get some of our drawings out. Um, so the next way that we've done this is the model in itself is a pretty sustainable model. So currently the, fund, the rent that we make from, the, from our vendors pays for one staff coordinator of the space and also for maintaining the space. Um, we've received uh, grants so that we could research the impact um, utilities are paid for by the city, so electricity, um, and rent, so the rent that we receive also subsidizes some of Skadden Court's underfunded programs as well. Um, initially, the city contributed about $25,000 um, to help us purchase our first, um, our first containers, uh, and we also received support around the permission to actually use the sidewalk. Great, so um, adaptability. So this picture that you see here is of Thorncliffe Park in Toronto, um, and that's where the Thorncliffe Park Women, Women's Committee wants to place their container. Um, Thorncliffe Park is a high-rise community. It's all residential, um, and it's a very different landscape than what you see in downtown Toronto where Market 707 is located. Um, and so, you know, Business Out of the Box is exploring now how, how we could use this kind of infrastructure to meet the needs of a high-rise, single-use neighborhood. And so this image is of another area that we're exploring to, um, to expand business out of the box. So this is done in partnership with the city of Hamilton, which is a city about 40 minutes outside of Toronto. Um, it's a former steel, steel, steel industry city um, and has a, a great finite down um, retail spaces down in downtown Hamilton. So if you look on the top right-hand corner, you'll see what some of the downtown landscape looks like, but you also see a lot of um, empty parking lots. So the city, the major university, and one of the big local nonprofits is partnering with us to explore expanding business out of the box in that parking lot that you see right there. So some of the lessons that that Scatting Court has learned in doing this is one, um, as Isaac was saying earlier, 
um, it's important to understand the resources that you have and to utilize um, uh, different support that's out there. So multi-sector multi support was definitely needed in getting this off, off the ground. Um, the second thing is the process needs to be accessible for immigrants. Um, so there's a lot of challenges for immigrants in creating a business plan and getting that initial capital um, uh, in, in acquiring loans and so on. So the process in itself we created um, to be flexible enough that, um, that refugees and newcomers could access it and, and rent out one of our spaces. Um, the next thing is flexibility with vendor agreements. So our leases are one-year leases, but some people have an idea and they're not sure that it's going to fit into to Market 707 and they don't want to take a risk of signing a one-year lease. So we'll allow them to, to test their product in a pop-up fashion. Um, next is connection to additional supports. So we provide the retail spaces and we provide some support in getting them off um, in getting their businesses off the ground. Um, however, we don't do anything. Like a lot of the resources Canva offers, we would not offer here. So we have to connect them to those resources that exist. Other things that are needed for, um, for people who don't have a lot of resources are childcare, um, language support, and so on. And so we would connect them to those services as well. Next is it's really important to, um, for us to be connected to the community. So um, this the success of the, of the space is relying on bringing the community to the space um, with community events, neighborhood um, activity, and so on. Um, next is the local app operator should be extremely active with marketing the, um, with marketing the space, um, bringing customers to the location, maintaining the space, resolving any um, conflicts that might arise. Um, and the final thing is creative solutions are needed when implementing some, something like this. For example, when Market 707 was introduced to Toronto, as this concept is being introduced to another city, Hamilton, there are no permission processes that are in place to allow for um, long-term shipping containers to become retail spaces. So we kind of have to be creative and work around the fact that we're not formally recognized as um, a retail space and, and create new um, and introduce a new process for other people to, to implement and adapt the same model. And thank you, that's, that's it for me. So if you guys have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Lena, thanks very much for sharing that with us. I think <clears throat> between both of you, there's some really excellent examples I've seen um, that have really worked on the ground. Just to the audience, for the remainder of the time, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we're going to do a moderated Q&A session. So please move to the chat box and submit your questions for Isaac, Lena, and myself. And we'll just get started with some initial questions that we've had. So the first one is from Kelly at Brightgo. And Lena and Isaac, this is for both of you. And it's definitely something I've come across as I've traveled to eight cities in terms of the distinction and the different practices between refugee and immigrants. Uh, so the question is, are there any big differences between refugees and other immigrants that are, are entrepreneurs? And how have you adapted the services accordingly? So maybe we can start with you, Isaac. Sure. Uh, so in our experience, uh, what we found uh, as a difference, uh, refugees, newly, newly settled refugees, uh, may be going through a, at least a year long process to really orient themselves, um, recover from migration trauma, uh, and their children or elderly relatives settled. Uh, it's really important when you're looking to start a business to have the basics of life um, taken care of first um, before you can go ahead and focus on uh, such a big project. Uh, so I think that's the biggest uh, difference between the two is really getting getting them acclimated, getting them into a position where uh, they're stable enough to go ahead and um, begin to, 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 to put in the effort to start their own business. 
Lena, do you um, have anything to add? Uh, so most of our um, most of our uh, entrepreneurs are are immigrants, so they've been in Canada for a longer period of time. Um, with with the newcomers, what our settlement services off office has explained is, or sorry, with refugees, is that they're not quite sure where they're going to end up in the area yet. They're not quite settled yet. So it takes them a longer time to um, decide that they would want to open up um, to open up a business. Uh, but I, I don't think I have clear statistics on uh, on what the differences have been between the two. I mean, for Amir, who just opened up with us and who's a very recent refugee, um, he had some catering experience, so it was easy for him to do this transition, and he has a stable home that's pretty close to the market. So maybe maybe the biggest distinction is just uh, in terms of how quickly they can accelerate. So if they have some prior experience or skills, that really is the, the thing that dictates their success versus whether they are an immigrant or a refugee. So we have another question which is based on the role of the media and promotion. How have they helped, if at all, in helping small businesses gain traction and exposure in your experience? Um, sure. For, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So for, for Market 707, media has played an, a pretty enormous role. So Market 707 on its, ro on its own has, a, has received a lot of media attention, but a lot of the vendors um, individually have um, told, shared their own story and have received a lot of press around what they've been able to introduce to the Toronto landscape, so things that we've never seen before, um, and uh, kind of explain the entrepreneurship story on their own. So. Um, yeah, media has played a very large role in, in for, for us. Uh, so for us, uh, I, I think that media does play a very large role. Um, I think this is where um, one of the advantages of having several partnerships comes in as well, um, because they have their own media contacts, and it's just that many more organizations um, going ahead and putting out some really great information on small business owners. And I certainly would um, look into local media and never underestimate local and community media, local blogs, um, community groups, really having an impact um, and developing the trust uh, within the community um, has been key for us. Great. Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in, so we may not be able to cover all of them, but let me go to the next one, which is from Lucia Zanova. So this is a theme I've seen over and over again. We've all seen the, the failure rates for any new business. Um, I think many fail within uh, three to five years at the rate, the percentage is very high. So Lucia's question is, what's do you have a statistic for the proportion of people who become self-sufficient and are successful and those who fail and why they fail? Maybe, Isaac, we can start with you on this one. Sure. Uh, so I don't have a, a, a solid number on the percentage of self-sufficient entrepreneurs that walk through our doors, but I will tell you some of the common denominators of those that do fail, unfortunately. Um, one major one is, of course, informality, as I spoke about earlier, um, the unwillingness to formalize yourself as an entrepreneur, um, not report your income uh, properly, uh, and really limiting your growth potential, right? Um, and, you know, in our experience with immigrant and refugee entrepreneurs, uh, the list of why that happens can go on and on, right? Um, so it's really about seeing the big picture um, and success, and I think that's the picture we try to paint for many entrepreneurs is really saying, you know, in the short run you may limit yourself a little bit as far as uh, paying more taxes and, you know, really uh, 
reporting your income properly, but in the long run, you don't limit your growth. Um, and I think that if entrepreneurs can get past that, um, we'll, you'll see a lot more success stories. But that's one of the major uh, differences. Uh, partnerships as well, um, really understanding who your partners are and uh, the legalities of uh, the partnership and really understanding what you're signing when you're signing, for example, an operating agreement uh, with one of your partners. We've seen that become a barrier as well. And, and just, to, just to add to that, this is something you and I spoke about, but do you think some of that reluctance comes from distrust of governments, uh, which is something they typically have in their home countries? Absolutely. Absolutely. Distrust with yeah. government, uh, distrust with financial institutions. Um, yeah, it's, it's really difficult to change uh, that mindset and those behaviors. Right. Lena, did you have anything to add on that one? Um, we, we also don't collect statistics around um, uh, the vendor's income and so on, but um, I, I think what, what we've seen with the vendors who've been able to grow is that they've been able to adapt their product um, to the local market and so you know, use the containers as a testing ground and then really change their, their product and um, adapt to what people want or what sells, um, I I wouldn't really feel comfortable um, talking about what has made the businesses um, that we've seen fail fail because I I don't think I know enough of that information. So let me move on to the next question, which is from Mona Alstea. Uh, so this is a question around capital. So this is typically. Uh, something that is a huge constraint for many uh, immigrants and, and refugees. Um, Mona Mon actually runs a charity in Toronto, so this is a question for, for both of you. Um, whether how SCCC and CAMB actually handle the access to capital challenge uh, for some of the entrepreneurs. Um, so for so the access to capital, um, it is a big challenge, and so a lot of the vendors who start out, they start out with um, using their own savings. So there, so for example, a business just opened up um, at Scadding Court uh, at Market 707, and um, he's selling grilled cheese. So his capital, his um, initial investment would have been fairly low. He needed to buy um, a sandwich press. Um, and I, so the concept of Market 707 is that you don't need to borrow from um, an external lender until you grow and you have the ability to, to kind of expand. Um, but there are um, resources where people could, could access capital, so nonprofits and different types of funders that, that will give microloans um, to small businesses. And so we would connect them to those resources. Great. Um, Isaac? Yeah, so um, for us, uh, I think one of the major services that we provide in this specific arena is uh, a small business financing workshop. So our workshops really revolve around major common denominators for our clients. And um, because this was a major challenge for many, many entrepreneurs that we were servicing, uh, our small business financing workshop really walks the entrepreneur through the application, small business financing application process, we seat them in the place of an underwriter and really start to identify what an underwriter looks for when they're looking to approve a small business loan. So really aligning your financial documents, um, teaching them how to read their personal credit report, um, and understanding um, usage of, you know, of debt and so on and so forth. And at the end of the course, they've put together their own financial package and really begin to understand that based on their financial documents, this is the amount they qualify for in financing. And then the steps begin on a one-on-one -on -one basis to place them in a position to qualify for, for financing in the near future. Great, thank you both uh, for those. Um, and, and for anyone in the audience that wants more information, uh, I'm, I'm assuming both of you that this is all available on your websites. 
on the programs you mentioned? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to tie in one question from the audience um, from the staff at Alio and, and something that I've seen. So many business, many cities provide resources for launching businesses. So in perhaps the first two years when an immigrant or refugee arrives. And many, I've seen that there's an almost an over allocation of resources on the launch, but in terms of sustainability and longevity of the businesses, so when you get to, for example, year three to five, which in my experience is, is probably one of the most challenging times in terms of being able to, to grow your business further, what do both of your organizations offer in the way of the longer term engagement? And I know, Isaac, you mentioned surveys that Canva does. Um, but this also speaks to Mustafa's question, which is, do they get ongoing hands-on support and monitoring um, as their business grows beyond the two-year point? Sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, we, we keep in touch with our clients uh, as, much as, as, as long as they're willing to keep in touch with us. Um, I think that one of the, the points that we stress is really aligning our services with the needs of our clients, and as clients grow their business, um, I think that we move toward a more tailored one-on-one -on -one service um, that really addresses you know, their, their potential growth and really getting them to write a business plan that's beyond the first two years of operation um, and thinking where they'd like to be in three to five years. Um, at this point, they're less reluctant to work on their challenges. They've, they've tasted a bit of success at this point. Um, and they see growth in the near future. So I must say it's, it's, they're much more committed to the work that's involved in doing so. Um, but you know, as technology changes as well, uh, we keep up to those changes and we provide training on technology tools that are going to improve their operations and also going to lead to their growth in the future. Um, at Scatting Court, we don't, um, we don't give them formal mentoring from the organization itself, but Within the vendor group, we've created um, sort of like a small uh, business improvement area, I guess you would call it. So the vendors meet monthly, and they give each other support. So when one vendor was having trouble marketing her business, um, another vendor who was really great at it um, helped her in doing that. And so they rely on each other a lot, but it's definitely more of an organic thing and not something that's, that's formal. Okay. Is is that something that you think you may evolve uh, to doing in the future, or you're really focused on um, the initial phases? At Scouting Court? Yeah. Um, so we're looking right now at, um, we're applying for funds to bring together um, various partners in the city who could create a more formal mentoring program for for our vendors themselves. Because um, Scouting Court, on its own as a community center, doesn't have the capacity to, to provide those services. And we're also looking at how to use the, the retail market, the vending market, um, sorry, the entrepreneurs within our markets to come together and do mentoring within, within our vendor network. So in addition to Market 707, we have seasonal markets that bring in 50 to 100 um, entrepreneurs selling their, their goods seasonally, as well as um, a separate catering kitchen that has a lot of um, people in the food services. Um, so we're looking at understanding how to formalize mentorship within our about 100 plus entrepreneurs. Okay, fantastic. I wanted to touch on the, the challenge of language briefly, which uh, Isaac, you had detailed in your presentation, and, and certainly I know this is a huge challenge to integration um, across several cities. Uh, we saw in the news today a, a point system uh, which may be launched in the US where priority is given to people that learn English. And something I saw in, in Berlin in Germany was uh, Syrian refugees and entrepreneurs have mandatory English, uh, German, uh, in, in order to uh, make sure the integration goes successfully. What's both of your views on uh, making the language of the country 
uh, and the training and that mandatory as it, as it relates to being able to successfully um, grow your businesses and integrate. Isaac, maybe we can start with you. Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, so, um, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that uh, English for us here is really important um, for growth, right? I think that establishing a business within a, an immigrant community, I think we've seen successful entrepreneurs that do not speak English. Um, but it, they are limited, right? They are limited to that community. So when we speak about growth, I think English does become a necessity, at the very least, the basic English language. Um, mm -hmm. Because what we found is that immigrant entrepreneurs that don't uh, speak English or can read English, they're taken advantage of. Um, they really are. Uh, many times it's by the community itself. Um, but when we are looking into creating contracts uh, and so on and so forth, they, they really don't have an understanding of what they're signing, which can become very, very dangerous um, in the long run for entrepreneurs. So at the very least, the basic understanding uh, of the language where an attorney can you know, help them uh, you know, understand what they're signing, uh, it, it's an advantage to them. And as they grow, you know, it does become somewhat of a necessity. And that's, that's why our ESL classes are so important um, and so many clients take advantage of it because they begin to understand uh, the advantages of understanding the language. Uh, of, of the, the country they've migrated to. I'm going to have to wrap up uh, there because we've actually run out of time. I just wanted to thank you both um, and the audience. This has been a really uh, insightful discussion. So on behalf of the High Immigrants Team, Cities of Migration, and Bertelsmann Siftang, uh, thank you, Isaac and Lena, for joining. And uh, please stay connected.